Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session today called Light Your Fire, Leveraging Public Art as a Platform for Teen Voices. I've already gotten some comments in the chat um, from Laura N. You're super excited for this session. The community has a ton of public art and your dream is to take your students on a tour to increase engagement in the arts. I love that. <laughs> um, we have a lot of art in Washington, DC where Amber and I are both located and we hope that you have some fun tips um, after our session. So just a heads up, we are having some technical difficulties this morning with, um, with my co-presenter, Amber, um, her computer is deciding that they don't want to do Zoom. <laughs> so she's going to join us as soon as she can. But for now, we're going to get started with just me. Um, and, you know, we have, I'm sure as all of you are aware, after the past two and a half years of Zoom life, we have this motto at the Hirshhorn that technology works until it doesn't. And so we are really testing that this morning, but we are um, excited um, still to present with all of you. Um, and while we're waiting on that, um, Kent asked a question, what is a good source for accessing public art remotely? Um, that's a great question, Kent. Um, let me see. Well, at the Smithsonian, we, um, we have an online platform called Learning Lab that has a lot of our Smithsonian collections on it. Um, so including like our public art and sculptures. And there's actually a learning lab dedicated to this entire topic that I'll share at the end of this presentation that has some examples of public art from the Hirshhorn collection, as well as some activities and questions that you can use, um, you can use with your students. So apart from that, I do, I think the first step is to like think about what public art is. And, you know, it's more than murals, it's more than sculptures. It can also be like video installations or um, like any kind of like public music, thing like that. And so whenever I'm searching for examples for um, my students often start, you know, with a search for like murals in Washington, D.C. or, um, you know, statues or things like that, but then kind of expand my image search beyond that. Um, so I hope that um, answers your question, Kent. Oh, and Kent, I'll also be sharing two, um, two artists in this session that um, both do public art, and so we at least have two people to look to. Okay, look at this. <laughs> Let's go. I hope you're as excited as I am. So, um, like I said, Amber will be joining us shortly as soon as she is able from her computer. Um, but I'll go ahead and start and introduce myself. My name is Sarah Capo. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the team programs manager at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. The Hirshhorn is part of the Smithsonian Institution, and we are the National Museum of Modern Art within the Smithsonian. I am standing, I'm sitting <laughs> in front of um, a brick wall and also a white wall, and I have several books and art behind me, and I have dark hair and am pale like a ghost. <laughs> so, not a really good started. Um, our schedule for the day is that we're going to first tell you a little bit about teen programming at the Hirshhorn, which we call Art Lab. Then we're going to talk about our Emerging Artists program, which is where the content that we're talking about today originated. And then we'll get into it. Um, I'll be talking about reimagining monuments and uh, to reflect a more expansive narrative and also how to use public art to tell a, met, to tell a story. And Amber, hopefully, will be talking with us about the modern blues structure as a method of storytelling. And, you know, if she doesn't, I have her notes and I'm a musician too, so we'll just see how that goes. <laughs> but, you know, we're gonna manifest that Amber will join in us soon. So, um, next slide. Oh, she's here. Oh, <laughs> yes. I made it. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys so much for your patience. I'm happy to be here. Um, 
I'm going to continue to let you talk about Art Lab. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Amber. We're glad that you can join us. So if you go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, what you'll need for today's session. So first, take a moment if you don't already have it in front of you to grab a pen, pencil, piece of paper. We encourage you to explore these activities along with us during the session. And um, also, we hope that you bring in excitement and an open mind. Um, Amber and I have had a lot of fun facilitating these activities in Art Lab, and we really hope that you enjoy them too. And last but not least, confidence. <laughs> We believe that these activities can be incorporated into your classroom, regardless of the subject matter. So like, for example, even if you've never explored the blues before, we hope that the structure of our method gives you the confidence to try it out for yourself. Next slide. So first question, what is Art Lab? As I mentioned before, it's our, um, it's the Hirshhorn's Creative Arts Programming for young people or teens, ages 13 and 19. You know, most importantly, our programming is teen driven. Art Lab is by teens for teens and our participants take on a huge role in shaping their own experiences within our programming. So it's also museum centered. And so through access to contemporary art and the Hirshhorn's exhibitions and collections, um, our programs equip young people to access their voice and their power through contemporary art so they can build the world that they want to see. Within our programming, we prioritize access, opportunity, and collaboration. So we provide an informal out-of-school learning environment for teens that's free and open to anyone. It's important for us that anyone can be able to experience art at the Hirshhorn. We also are all about opportunity. So when we're bringing in um, you know, new contemporary artists, we try to get them in front of our students as much as possible. Um, because they are our next generation of artists of our time. And so um, we want them to have that opportunity. And last but, not least, last but not least, collaboration. Like we are by teens for teens, we are very much in and of DC, the city. And so we collaborate with DC public schools and other organizations across DC to really spread the reach of the Hirshhorn as much as we can. And our programming itself is structured to prioritize collaboration. So with everyone's work, contributing to a larger goal like a public exhibition or a teen night at the museum or a presentation to the Hirshhorn staff about how to make the Hirshhorn a more accessible place for teens. So we're all collaborating together. Okay, so today we'll be sharing applicable lessons on integrating art into the classroom um, based on our experiences with teens and digital art and music. And specifically, we hope that the connections we make to public art will have applications to all subject matter areas. Obviously the arts, ELA, social studies, um, environmental science, and more. And now I'm going to turn it over to Amber so she can tell you a little bit about Emerging Artists, which is the program where this stuff all originated. Hi, um, we can move to the next slide. And I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about Emerging Artists, which is one of my favorite programs at Art Lab. So Emerging Artists is a semester long project where young people um, who are talented and want and are driven about their, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and are driven about their artistic endeavors, come together to conceptualize, execute, and create a vision based on a theme, interest, or subject matter. The Emerging Artist Program is an in-depth educational experience for teens seeking to enhance their creative process. It's created for teens who are ready to take their skills to the next level. Um, we provide them with opportunities that are exclusive to Art Lab. We have so much technology and opportunities for them. Um, and it's also a great opportunity to collaborate with the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum. So some of our breakout, I would say, emerging artist programs um, like to highlight a lot of different types of things that you don't typically see at a museum. So one of our programs was called 50% that highlighted the lack of exhibition and art opportunity for female identifying artists in some of the highest artistic institutions. Another was called the Salon. Um, that was basically based on the experiences, the dynamics, and the community of Black hair. Um, and then another one was called School of Hip Hop. 
Um, and this particular program gave a lot of access to students who were interested in music production and songwriting um, and gave them the chance to pair up with mentors and also get a really in-depth um, set of knowledge and tools about the hip hop art form to, for them to be able to um, include into their own songs and pieces. So a lot of the different art forms that we um, either have people who are well immersed into the field or have just a, a certain set of tool kits or two um, tools in their toolbox, music production, songwriting, graphic design, 3D printing, uh, graffiti, fabrication, filmmaking, journalism, uh, curation, painting, drawing, public speaking, because performance in itself or just engaging with people to be able to see your art is a form of public speaking. Um, we dive into a lot of different types of technologies and so much more. Um, one thing that we really pride ourselves on is Art Lab not being your traditional educational space. So our pedagogy that we follow is HAMAGO, um, which stands for hang out, mess around and geek out. Um, and using this approach, you know, our mentors encourage our teens um, for, on their interests and create their own learning trajectories to foster their own values. So Art Lab strives to be a radical space of inclusivity, but we also like to welcome in um, a safe learning environment. So some of the things that differentiate our learning um, space from your typical, I would say traditional school setting um, is Hamago allows us to be organic, intergenerational, collaborative, um, experimental, engaging, process-oriented, safe, empowering, individualized, fun, creative, and ultimately stress-free. Um, it is not like your typical um, learning setting that might be, or sh shall I say school setting, that could be kind of static, a door oriented, um, concrete or fixed. So we do improvise a lot and allow our students to do the same. Um, it's nothing like formal schooling, um, especially when it comes to some feelings of um, ageism um, and it can't, and it's not a limiting um, or boring type of space. Um, so we find that this, this type of um, pedagogy allows for a great deal of impact. Um, some of the things that we've been able to see um, with these practices and philosophies is our intention is implemented to bring in large amounts of people into our, um, into our final exhibitions. We've seen um, numbers increase in programming, not just during the after school hours, but also in the amount of people that come to these um, museum curated events. So we open up the open up the museum for extended hours, late night hours, and it brings in intergenerational engagement, which is something we're, we're very proud of and pride ourselves on. Um, and it also allows the young people to give um, voice to the things that they find awareness about with the backing of a solid institution. Um, and last and most important, it's free. So it's free to all age, well not all ages, all um, wards. So it doesn't matter what ward you might live in here in Washington, D.C. Um, it doesn't matter what school you go to, what, you know, religious practice you might have or may not have or sexual orientation you may have or may not have. It's literally open and we pride ourselves on being able to have such a diverse community of talented young people. All right, we can move to the next slide. Muted. Okay, so now that we um, talked a little bit about Art Lab and our Emerging Artists program, we're going to get right into it with our um, storytelling techniques. So as I shared earlier, we're going to be sharing two different ways to explore storytelling that you can use in your classrooms to encourage students to connect their voice and their power through public art and music. So first, we're going to talk about reimagining monuments, monuments <laughs> and memorials. Over the past decade, the conversation about the role of monuments in society has expanded into a global topic, sparking the rethinking of public spaces around the world. People have begun to question whose stories are being told by these symbols and the voices and stories of women, particularly those of black, brown and indigenous women are vastly underrepresented in our public spaces and in our monuments. In our emerging artist program this spring, we had our students reflect on the Washington area and also about the stories currently happening this spring in the news. 
and to contribute their own perspectives and by creating their own collective monument. So to get right into it, I'm gonna ask a lot of reflective questions and I would encourage you to follow along or answer them for yourself in, um, on your piece of paper, or you can also use the Q&A function and let us know what you're thinking as you, we move throughout this activity. So first, what is a monument or a memorial? Um, I found two definitions that I really like that I use in my practice. From the Studio Museum of Harlem, a monument is a lasting evidence, reminder, for example, of something or someone noticeable or great. From Monument Lab, which is a public art and history studio in Philadelphia, a monument is a statement of power and presence in public. How would you define a monument or a memorial? Is there a difference between the two? What are monuments um, to you from the past? And what can monuments be in the future? Is your personal definition of a monument different than one that you would use in your classroom? Using these definitions and these types of questions, um, how can we redefine and reimagine monuments and memorials that speak to us and tell our stories? What is the future of monuments and what can monuments be in the future? For example, in my educational practice, I tend to think about monuments and their role within a larger public space. Um, I come from a background in design education, so I'm always thinking about public spaces and the urban environment and how these things affect all of us. So I want monuments to be dynamic and defined by their meaning and not be these like immovable, untouchable artifacts of our past. And I imagine a future where monuments are community driven and also driven by joy, regeneration and repair. So to give some examples of this, um, next slide, we're gonna talk about two contemporary artists who explore monuments as a large part of their practice. So first, Abigail DeVille, we focused on her in our Emerging Artist Program this spring. And you see pictured here, um, we had this installation outside of the Hirshhorn Museum. So Abigail DeVille is a New York-based sculpture who uses history itself as a raw material. She brings untold stories to light and creates installations that can provoke and inspire us, like this installation pictured here, Light of Freedom. So this piece was inspired by an 1876 picture depicting the Statue of Liberty's disembodied hand in Madison Square Park. I don't know if there are any fellow Gilded Age fans here from that HBO show, but if you seen, saw that show, you might remember there's a scene where they go and actually see that disembodied hand in the park. Um, so that actually did happen, it was there. <laughs> so um, in this piece, um, DeVille has built golden scaffolding frames around the torch to kind of invoke a construction site or progress or change. There's a lattice cage that makes up the handle instead of a solid handle and it wraps around a rusted bell that can be seen but not rung. Above it, flames are composed of outstretched mannequin arms painted deep blue to reference the hottest part of fire. So in referencing America's long heralded emblem of freedom, Statue of Liberty, DeVille created this piece in response to George Floyd's death in the summer 2020 and with the uprisings that followed it across the nation. So she takes this classic American symbol of freedom and asks us to consider who democracy is for, who has the right to freedom. And her work in general discusses the role of public art and performance and the roles that can play in bringing to light untold and overlooked stories so we can understand them in relation to our current times and also as we look to the future. So another artist that we're gonna look at, next slide, is named Marin Hassinger. And she is a Harlem-based artist working in sculpture, video, installation, and performance art. And as you can see, her, um, her work is a bit different than Abigail DeVille's, but I actually really like their contrast. Um, she considers the natural world a site of hope and potential a place where a place of equality where we all have a shared purpose of caring for and understanding the environment. Um, so her pieces here are taken directly from the surrounding environment in this park. Pictured here are two structures, both built out of local twigs and branches. Um, and one of them is kind of a wall shape. And the next picture is a person of someone like adding to the 
structure. So her series really takes this, this monument series, it's literally called Monuments, um, takes a unique spin on the idea of public art um, because these pieces are created in communal experiences. So Hassinger like, brings together local community members and uses local branches, twigs, and other materials to construct these pieces as a team. So she did this um, at the Studio Museum of Harlem, which is where these pictures are from. And she did it again in um, DuPont Circle in Washington, DC um, a couple of years ago. So this emphasis on communal experiences and building a monument together is a through line through all of Hassinger's public artwork. So while her monument series um, has definitely a less concrete inspiration than DeVille's, I find that they're both um, highlighting or thinking of monuments in a new different way, either through untold stories or really honoring like the people and the community and the environment. So I like to hope that both of these works can move us toward a more futuristic definition of monuments, um, especially I mean, really both of them, but um, I like how Hassinger's monuments honor the social achievements of the community and celebrate possibilities of humans working together in nature. Like for you environmental science teachers, like how cool that art is made from nature. So next slide, you might be thinking, okay, Sarah, all of this art is cool and great or not, <laughs> um, but how does it apply to me in my classroom? So I'm now gonna walk us through a series of reflection questions and potential activities that you can use to explore monuments and memorials. And th these activities can be scaffolded um, up or down to meet your needs as a teacher. Also, again, this is where that um, pencil and paper come in. <laughs> so we'd love for you to participate along with us. The first, um, I'd love for you to identify a cause or social movement or a topic even a person that's important to you. Um, remember those big expansive definitions of monuments that I mentioned earlier, especially that we want it to be something that you want to be highlighted. Um, so if you wanted to provide stronger parameters to your students, you could definitely do this on one selected topic, whether you're looking at a certain era of history in class or um, just like kind of limit them all to one topic or um, just expand it to anything. So after you identified your cause or story, next you gotta write about it. Why is this cause important to you? What is the history of it? What are some aspects that people might find surprising? What is surprising to you about it? Um, what are three to five words that you could use to describe this cause? How would you explain this cause to a friend? So next, after you've written some about it, think about artists like DeVille and Hessinger and their non-traditional use of materials. What materials might you use to create a monument to this cause? Um, what materials tell the story? It is, an, is it important for you to use materials that are non-traditional, like the ones we've seen today? Or would using something traditional like marble or bronze offer an interesting contrast to your subject matter? So after we've done some brainstorming, it's time to visualize it. And this is where you can really make this activity as in-depth as you want or need it to be. So the first option that I use all the time in my practice is making a collage or vision board, inspiration board for anything. So for this topic, you would have your students reflect on what they've written about their cause um, and those, especially those inspiration words that they wrote down. Um, what colors come to mind when they read over their inspiration words? Tastes, sounds, smells, materials. What mood or emotion do they want their piece to evoke? And then um, that's when we break out the magazines for collaging and I ask students to just pick any picture or image that they feel represents their inspiration words and they make a collage from that. So another option is to have them just sketch out their ideas for their monuments. I um, mean, this option is definitely more concrete and is than the collages for sure, and is great for students um, that have trouble thinking abstractly, um, like especially for younger ages, um, because that collage abstraction can be a difficult jump sometimes. So the last and most in-depth option is to have them build a small model of their monument. You could use these monuments to build your own monument row for your school or your town. 
or you could even reimagine the National Mall and replace the monuments here with monuments that you think should be represented in our nation's capital. Really the key to this activity is to have the students visualize in some way. Um, so like I said before, my background is in design education and I'm always gonna recommend um, some constant like feedback or critique um, throughout the creative process. So that looks like having students share their visualization with a peer and receive feedback. Does it communicate what they want it to, especially their inspiration words? And if it doesn't, what should they change? The words to match their design, the design to match the words, or also are they okay with ambiguity and having it be open to several interpretations, like something like Marin Hassinger's work? And I like to repeat this as much as possible, like even if you're doing all three steps, like have them get feedback after each step, because the more that you repeat this feedback process, the more confident students are going to be um, in their ideas and receiving that feedback in general. Okay, so it's been a lot about monuments. It's a topic that clearly I'm very passionate about, and I hope that you've enjoyed um, this line of questioning, this exploration. If you've been working along with me and on your own idea and are feeling brave, I would invite you to share your topic or maybe your inspiration words in the Q&A box. Um, or if you have any questions about this activity, definitely add those to the Q&A box as well and I can answer them at the end of the session. Um, and now um, let's hear from Amber um, about music with the message. All right, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing all of that great information about monuments. And it was exciting to be able to um, see all of those things come to life during our last uh, season of Emerging Artists. So now let's talk about music with a message. Um, and I wanna approach it from looking at the blues. Um, and I know some of you are wondering like, why the blues? Well, to me, the blues is literally the foundation of American music. If you think about rock and roll, if you think about where R&B now, where R&B is now, and how um, a lot of it has blended with pop, blended with hip hop, um, it all started from, from the blues. And the blues derived from gospel, but the blues is absolutely one of the most important foundations of American music. Um, and I want to kind of dig into storytelling by observing the blues, but also observing what we call the 12 bar blues structure. Um, we're also going to take a look at some of its most notable artists. And I've picked three pretty standout artists that I believe um, have will kind of show us through different eras how the blues has evolved and also how the structure, the sound, even some of the storytelling has changed um, from the 1920s to the 1990s. Um, and then we're also going to um, take a look at some examples of how you can utilize not only the structure, but the idea of storytelling um, as a way to communicate with students, as a way for students to be able to open up about different subject matters, um, and to be able to even apply structure in different ways that maybe um, hadn't necessarily been considered before. I know young people love music. Um, I've taught in so many different types of settings, um, and I've taught things that aren't music. I've taught entrepreneurship. I've taught um, curation, all different types of things that allow people to think differently, but music has always been the core of it. And I find that there's so many different ways to utilize such a strong, um, strong artistic medium to be able to connect with others. So let's move to the next slide. All right, so think about it. What comes to mind when you think about the word, the blues? Um, now, this is a great prompt question that I love to ask students, um, and I love for them to give me their feedback in multiple ways so you can write down what is your, what phrase comes to mind, if colors come to mind, um, doodling is a great way to kind of flow through some of those ideas as well. So take a moment and think to yourself what, what comes to mind when you think of the, of the term, the blues. Um, and if you choose to doodle, great. If you choose to write, even if it's just freehand words, that's also a great way to approach, um, to approach thinking about the blues. All right, let's move to the next slide. Okay, so the blue structure. Now, I know that I'm speaking to a lot of different types of educators, but one thing I 
I, I would like to go out on a limb and say is that most of you all have some sort of structure, some sort of formula to arrive at a um, culmination of thoughts, ideas, um, theories, what have you. Approach the blues in that same type of a way. So this AAB lyrical structure is just that. It's a compilation of rhymed couplets. So we're going to take a look at the example um, by W.C. Handy. And the song is called the St. Louis Blues. We're going to listen to an example by one of the three artists that I chose to highlight in this, um, in this series. But if you take a look at the example, the A reads, I hate to see the evening sun go down. Then it repeats as the second A and says the same thing. I hate to see the evening sun go down. The B is a little different. The B is going to conclude what is this thing that we keep talking about in the A? And it says, it makes me think I'm on my last go round. So this all happens in a 12 bar structure. So if we move to the next slide, we can see what that looks like. This is the 12 bar blues structure. Now I don't want this to intimidate anybody. It, it can, you know, oftentimes treble claps and staffs and all of those things can look like a foreign language. But if you are a math teacher, these are also great ways to, um, <clears throat> to engage with your students. I know that um, math was a troublesome subject for me, but once I started playing piano and once I started learning how to read music notes, um, it was extremely helpful for me to kind of correlate the two in a different way. So this 12 bar structure literally outlines um, it's going to be four bars each, and each bar is going to play a certain chord. Those chords are the one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. So they repeat in certain sections. So if you take a look at that first line where it has the, um, the well, capital I, but that's considered the one. So the one chord repeats four times. Then we move down to the next four bars, and then we have the four, the, I'm sorry, the four chord, the five chord, the four chord, the one, the one, the five, the four, the one, and then the five. So if you have any spare time and you want to take a look at to how this sounds, um, you'll definitely be able to find it on any, almost in any song, to be honest with you, because this is still a structure that's used in modern music today. But we'll hear an example of it in the um, song selections. Can we move to the next slide, please? All right. So these are the three notable women that I um, would love to share with you guys about who I think really kind of usher in um, not only that blue structure, but they also tell amazing stories. All of them are great singers, great songwriters, um, and producers as well. I don't think we give, you know, um, female producers enough credit. We look at producers as somebody who has to have a certain type of a role or play, you know, a particular instrument, but being in the booth, thinking of, you know, different harmonies, thinking of how you hear all the other instrumentation, that too is production. Um, so the first artist that I would like for us to listen to, if we can pull up um, the song St. Louis Blues. We're going to listen to um, a rendition of St. Louis Blues by Bessie Smith. Now, while we're listening, I want you guys to really listen to, again, that AAB structure. Now, we've already seen an example of it before as it was written out, but now I want you guys to hear what it sounds like. So we could play that. That would be great. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So her 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 interpretation, or should I say her example of really singing the AAB structure was literally the foundation of how um, R&B music started to develop into what we now consider a hook, a chorus, those types of things. But it starts with this literal structure. She repeats the first two lines and then concludes her statement with that last line. And she did that twice. So it's almost like taking the song and it being one half, and then we're going to repeat that exact same thing over again. Um, again, this is a great way to observe structures. Um, so let's take a listen to Aretha Franklin. She's going to be singing Hello Sunshine. And let's try to see if we can hear some of the similarities and differences in this example as well. That was Hello Sunshine by Aretha Franklin. Now, if you are, if you could pay attention to, to those two things side by side, um, Aretha Franklin has kind of developed it a little bit more. She's gone further into giving you a little bit more explanation um, almost just before the, com the B comes in. So she says, hello, sunshine. So glad to see you, sunshine. Repeat again, hello, sunshine. It's been dark for a very long time. I can't explain what I've been through. No, no. Trying to live my life without you. People say I act, I act so strange, but you got the power to make me change. So we still have that rhyming um, formula happening. We still have that AAB structure happening, even if it's a little bit more elongated. So let's now take a listen to um, Mary J. Blige, who's one of one of my favorites, somebody that I absolutely grew up on listening to, was very inspired by as a singer. Um, and we're going to listen to a song called You Remind Me. Um, let's only play 139 to 217 just so I'm staying on, on time with our presentation today. All right. So now we have ushered ourselves into the 90s. We still have that repetition happening. We still have that same structure happening. I want you guys to um, also be able to kind of think about how this has evolved. If you want to compare it to if we're still talking about math variables, you'll add little things in. There'll be some subtle differences, but you always will arrive at some conclusion. Even if it's a little bit different, we're still using formulas to arrive um, at a conclusion, at a final thought, a final feeling. Um, and we're considering feelings all the way throughout it. So let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so this next tool um, is a great way and a great example of how to 
kind of go through the songwriting process. Um, this is, again, for, for all types of learners um, and something that I really love to use, especially with um, new songwriters and people who might be a little bit intimidated by what that process looks like. So I've kind of broken it, broken it down into a wheel. Um, now, if you would like to use this um, on your own, I encourage all educators to, to do the same and to maybe even think about how you would use it in other ways. If you're writing different types of things that, that aren't, that isn't music, maybe it's a term paper, maybe it's a poem and you want to kind of get your students out of the monotony of writing in the same way. Um, so you could easily turn some background music on and have them use this as a way to kind of shift through some processes and ideas. So I like to start by deciding um, if I'm going to be singing over my own original song or if I'm going to be singing over something that already exists. Then the next thing I like to do is ride the wave. So I'm going to hum melodies and rhythms over a beat to see what naturally takes place. And I'm having fun with it. I'm not pressuring myself. I'm not, you know, stressing myself out about, oh, this doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. I'm literally just riding the wave, catching the vibe. Okay, then the next thing is rhythm nation. Now that you've got your rhythm and your melodies in place, let's make sure we're in key. Now that might be a little difficult to do if you aren't um, with someone who may be able to find, like say a note on a keyboard, but if you are listening and you're, you're listening to the song or the beat that's playing behind you, you can kind of tell when you're off. I know a lot of people think that they can't, but most people have a great sense of understanding, oh, this feels like I'm in the right place. The next thing we want to do um, is we are going to add the words in. Now, this is the main ingredient. So this is where that initial prompt of what do you feel about the blues, what things come to mind, this is where you can incorporate that information to help you um, kind of warm up to what your, what your melody is going to be, what your phrases might be, things of that nature. Now you're going to tag team and put it all together. So you'll practice your melody, your rhythm, and your words, and then you can feel free to record yourself. Um, sometimes I like to record myself on my phone. Um, if you have any type of like, you know, laptop device, things of that nature, you're free to use those as well. And the last thing is press record or in this, in this instance, have confidence, be able to share those things that you have created with your peers, with your um, audience, whomever it might be. All right, now let's move to the last slide. So these are the things that, you know, we want you all to, to try for yourself. Um, with music, with the message, I encourage you to, to consider prompt questions as well. So like we mentioned, um, what is the blues? What things come to mind? Allow your students to share colors, feelings, even if it's people or other artists. Um, then also consider what other structures are similar to the AAB song form. So if it's formulas in math or science that allow you to arrive at a conclusion, that's the same thing as a song structure, maybe even letter writing formats in English or creative writing um, and things, again, things that, that repeat to allow you to arrive at, at some sort of conclusion. Another thing to consider um, is using this as a form of storytelling, getting out of your normal, you know, pulling students to, um, to kind of get deeper into their research. All of those types of things is a great way. Um, these songwriting formulas and formats are a great way to help with all of those different practices. So I hope that this introduction to the blues and the 12 bar um, blues structure and the artists have given you some inspiration to approach storytelling in a entirely different way. You're muted. <laughs> and, uh, next, actually skip to the last slide. Yes, so I know that we are a little bit over time. And so thank you so much everyone for sticking with us. Um, we hope that you enjoyed our session today. And if you do have questions, um, please put them in the chat right now. We'll try to answer them with as much time as we have. But I also wanted to include our contact information. You're welcome to email us your questions too. Um, I wanna call out one question in particular from Eileen um, who asked any examples or resources about teens advocating responses for influencing public art policy, public art created in response to public art. 
Um, I love this question. I have no idea <laughs> off the top of my head. And so I'd invite you to email me about it and I'll do some research and we'll figure it out together. Um, also, while you're writing your questions into the chat, um, here's the resource I mentioned earlier, um, learninglab.si.edu. Um, on that page, we have a collection called Using Your Voice in Public Art. And that page has um, a lot of the activities that we mentioned earlier today. Um, it is currently in the process of being updated. So check on it today and then check on it in like a week and there'll be even more activities there. Um, and now let's see, there seems like there's some questions coming through. Oh, no, just thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so. Ooh, Amber, uh, this is a question for you. How do we encourage teens to have more confidence in their creations? Um, honestly, um, I've, I've found over the years that it is, it's, it's a great thing to kind of meet them where they are, even if that means literally meeting them one-on-one -on -one before allowing them to share it with a larger audience, um, asking them questions about how they derived at the things that they are creating um, and giving them the space, giving them the just the time to kind of to to build that confidence. It's not going to ha happen overnight. Um, and I also do certain exercises with a lot of my young people that allow them to calm down and not be so focused on who's in the audience, but the fact that they have the opportunity to share something that they've created. So if it's um, deep breaths, um, I like to do a lot of stretching. Um, saying affirmative things um, as a group and being able to just identify, you know, with gratitude, this is an opportunity that, you know, it's a gift to be creative. And that in many ways give them the inner confidence that they'll need that will shine, you know, kind of outwardly. I hope that was helpful. And I'm getting a note that we do need to wrap up. But one thing that I also want to add to that question, similar to Amber's um, like stretches and um, affirmations. I love doing a power pose with teens, especially if they're really shy in that one-on-one -on -one situation, because who doesn't feel goofy doing a power pose, but I think you'd be surprised at how much like, you know, like the Superman. <laughs> um, and also what I mentioned earlier about that feedback process, um, you know, I found that building confidence by having students work like one-on-one -on -one first and then share to a larger group also builds their confidence and okay now I'm getting to like okay we really need to wrap up go. sorry guys but please email us um we can share that learning lab link with you if you email okay great thank you thanks everyone bye